So the um, the slides are available. I noticed some people already brought them up. As uh, we've been doing, I'm going to jump slides. Um, and so uh, pay attention more to what I'm saying than what you see on the slide. Also, I'm willing to talk about anything about any of the slides with our presenter or not. So we're um, waiting for time constraints, so we're going through it. Today's talk is on whom, when, and where the systems chain to situate value, services, and socio technical affirming from ESIS. So, <clears throat> a lot of words there I need to explain. Uh, one of the ideas, though, is that when we're working with the socio ecological first, we're working from outside the system, and this is more working inside the system. And so there's more behavioral stuff that happens here. So the agenda, and we'll cover, make sure to cover all this. Uh, I'm going to do a preamble on epistemic technium phronesis, which sometimes, sometimes answers the question about how you're approaching a system and what question you're asking. Uh, I'm going to cover the uh, Rethinking Systems Thinking paper uh, that was published when I was ISIS as president. Uh, but I'm going to reorder it because I've, I've added stuff on it since then. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, systems changes being situated, which means that it's not a universal thing. It is something that happens on, on a place as opposed to ideal seeking. And ideal seeking has very much to do with teleology and goal seeking. And so you'll start thinking about whether the way that you think about systems is actually goal-oriented and whether that's appropriate or not. Uh, we'll talk about values, judgment, and soft systems thinking. Uh, we'll start off with Vickers' appreciative systems, and that rolls into Checklin's work. And actually, the reference that, we, that I'm using is an article that was published by uh, Checklin describing Vickers, because Vickers, for the proper English judgment, it didn't believe in using diagrams. And so you have to read the full text, whereas um, the other quirk that you get with Checklin is Checklin believes in hand drawing everything, and so you never can use a computer. He hand draws everything and then scans it in. Uh, but there's a policy and impact level, which is what Vickers did, and then when you get into the consequences of systems change, that's much more what happens when you're going through uh, uh, Checklin's work. Uh, we'll talk about service systems, and service systems as a contrast to production systems, because most of the time when people think about, about systems, they go input, process, output. And that's how you push a system, but how do you pull a system? The demand. Uh, the side service system work that uh, was done, uh, Jim Sporer was at IBM uh, Research when he started this, Jim Kojima uh, was in Tokyo and had these meetings for 10 years that Peter and I went to. And we'll talk about the shift from material products to information services in the economy. And then finally, the socio-technical systems theory will go back to the original legacy of the Tavistock Institute with uh, Emery and Trist. Uh, Raphael Ramirez is at Oxford. He's the scenario, known as the scenario planning guy, but he's actually a graduate of ACOS program. Uh, so he has history in system thinking, and uh, we can discuss how he does and doesn't use that. We have the idea of co-production and design principles when we come through that. Let me add something to the agenda that just the agenda for the whole class. Uh, this is actually... Uh, the. This is what uh, Lorraine was going to say. So uh, since we started the system story and found a good segue to David, let me add to the agenda that um, we'll have about 45 minutes going up to the break. So it might start the break a little later. And just so we can have a good complete point uh, to end with, uh, with, with David's lecture. Um, after the 15 minute break, we'll give you the, the choice. And we don't need to vote on this right now, but think about it. We'll either... Um, uh, we'll either have an open workshop session and the three of us can work with teams for, you know, the hour and 15 minutes or so, hour and a half, or however long you've got between then and, and the time that you want for lunch and before the next class. So we can work with you in workshops on P1. The other alternative is we now have the Echo Policy CD and access to it online. It's a simulation game. We could run that in like two weeks after you know, not, not the first week back from break, but probably the second, and try to work it into another session. But we have that available. We did that with full time, probably because we've been able to spend more time with them workshopping, because, you know, they're, they don't have a class before or after Wednesday, you know, so we've had more time with them. So if you need time with us in workshop, we'll just check in with you at that time and let you answer them. So those are our options for this, the after break. Okay, 
for the first lecture, I talked about um, a five-question sequence. Uh, and so the which question, which you've been grappling a lot with, is which system are you talking about? Which system change are you talking about? Uh, the what, you end up, uh, we, we kind of brushed over that, um, but you end up describing which, what are the dynamics that are happening in the system. Uh, we covered the why last year, last week, um, and now we're focused on the whom, when, and where. What are the impacts? And this has to do with phronesis in systems changes, and I'll explain phronesis. Uh, an authentic systems approach engages its enemies. Uh, this is from Wes Churchman, who wrote the systems approach. The systems approach fundamentally is scientific. You come at it, you understand things from a scientific perspective, uh, science is a pursuit of truth, but there are other ideals that come, come with that. Um, you have other things that get in the way, which is politics, morality, religion, and aesthetics. And so the question is, what do you do? So let's take aesthetics as an example. So you have science, and this is the right thing to do scientifically, but it's super ugly. How do you deal with that? If the system approach is well designed, you end up that you would actually figure out a way to bring that into your systems approach, because there's more systems than just the science. And so this is kind of the challenge we get when we talk about you know, what is science, and you end up with this discussion quite often when you're doing policy work, because the scientists will come and say, this is what we want to do. Uh, one of the common examples of, of debate would be uh, nuclear power. So nuclear power, do you want a nuclear power plant or not? Well, rationally, it turns out that most of the time nuclear power is yes, because it doesn't have much waste, it, you know, it can be maintained, it's well controlled, but there's this response against it. And so the question, who should be evaluating that? And we have the idea of what's called post-normal science that uh, Jerry Rabbits has. And post-normal science said you should involve all the, citizens, all the citizens in that discussion. If you involve the citizens in it, there's going to be more than just a scientific discussion. Or you could have a scientific discussion where it's all the physicists come out and say, well, this is what's going to happen. And the biologists will come and say, well, but this is what happens in biology. Did you take into account this and how how nature will take over your nuclear plant someday. So trying to deal with these is part of the system's approach. It's not just rational. You have to bring in these other parts. And these are the issues that you deal with when you're really dealing inside the system. We end up with this map of ignorance. This is from the originally from the uh, College of Medical Ignorance at the University of Arizona. And when they're training doctors, doctors are actually first trained to be certain because when a patient, when you tell a patient that the patient's got cancer, the, the first question they're going to ask is, are you sure? And a doctor that doesn't portray confidence will not laugh very long. Um, but on the other hand, doctors need to understand that there are limits to science. Science is based off human knowledge. So then we have these categories here. We have known unknowns, all the things you don't know, you know you don't know. This is actually a good thing. If you know you don't know, you can do research. You have errors, all the things you think you know, but you don't. The interesting thing about errors is that errors are something that require a social interaction. Because the only way that you can really know that you're an error is someone else has to tell you. Very rarely do you go, well, you could look in hindsight and say, well, I made an error. But before you actually have the action, someone will tell you, no, don't do that. It's not a good idea. And you go, why is that? Well, it's an error. You're going to make an error. There is the unknown knowns, all the things that you don't know you know. These are implicit competencies. So if we had a tsunami flood here, anyone that hasn't been swimming in a pool for the past 10 years, all of a sudden is going to learn to swim or remember how to swim. You can add on to that. The unknown unknowns, all the things you don't know, you don't know. The unknown unknowns, unknown unknowns are why we actually use the system approach. And we want a system approach that brings in new knowledge. So you've got to be careful when you do systems, you go, okay, this is what's happening. And you go, no, no, this is ecology outside, and you sweep in that new knowledge. So the unknown unknowns is the real value of the system thinking. However, on the other hand, you've got these other two categories of taboos and denials, which are things that are undiscussable. My favorite example of this, we'll go back a couple of decades, but it's traditional Chinese medicine. So for a long time, there's Western medicine, and they said, okay, there's traditional Chinese medicine, it doesn't work. Okay, so we have this happening, the government's saying, do we regulate or do we not regulate it? How do you regulate something that doesn't exist, or doesn't work? So in order to 
bring it into the house, so you say, okay, we've got to recognize there's some good, good things for traditional Chinese medicine, there's some bad things, but in order to do that, we have to bring it into the science. So if we don't bring it into the science, we say it's all folklore, then it's kind of like we can't regulate. So there's a, there's a catch 22 there about whether you make it a taboo or don't make it a taboo. Now, we have these three categories, and this is what um, is published in the uh, Rethinking System Thinking article. We have the ideas of epistemi. Epistemi, the way, easy way to describe it is learning why. Um, and what they're trying to do is uncover universal truths. This is science, and that's when you have epistemology. This is science in the purest sense. You have analytic scientific knowledge. The way you do this is through research. The nature is universal, invariable in time and space, and context independent. And so what you're saying is that when the apple falls out of the tree, it falls out of the tree the same way every time. Now the context could say, well, okay, if, you're, if you, if you um, have an earthquake, will it change? You go, well, maybe the tree moves or it goes sideways or something else. But in effect, what you're trying to say is it's universal knowledge. This is different from technique. Techni is learning how, and the how is not just an individual thing, it is a collective thing. Instrumental rationality towards a conscious goal. You're actually building something. It's a craft, like technique. Uh, it is technical knowledge, it's oriented towards production, it's pragmatic. When you say pragmatic, it means it works. And so research works off axioms. And so when you start off from mathematics, you build up this whole branch, you say, this is how logic is built up. But when you're working with technique, technique is it works or it doesn't work. So consulting methods are really interesting that way, or building software. Uh, so a lot of software, uh, a lot of the agile development, in effect, they've done because it works. And then you kind of go backwards and you build the theory, but it doesn't come with a, a, a formula that says, oh, you know, we're going to create the science, and then from that we're going to derive the application. It goes the other way around, which is you have the technique first, and from that you go back into the epistemic. The orientation is towards production, getting stuff done, pragmatic, but it's variable in time and space and it's context dependent. So when you're thinking about science in the traditional sense of epistemi, it is not universal. This is the, the, uh, the technique is not universal. It depends on where you are, and that's where the human factor starts coming in. Now you could get a machine to try to understand whether the context changes or not. So, um, if you talk about uh, a, a phone now that has location services, it presents you different things. What that's trying to do is actually say that there's some more context there, but that's more like epistemi than it is like uh, technique. Technically, more like a neural network. A neural network, you really can't explain what's happening inside, but it works. So it's, that's fine. The third category, phronesis. Phronesis is learning when, learning where, and learning whom. And the examples are, so you, you might have a friend who always does the most inappropriate things at the wrong time. And it's kind of like, they do the right, they're doing something which is not bad or wrong, but just, this is not the time or place for that. And phronesis by Aristotle was considered to be the primary pursuit. Epistemi was not the primary pursuit. Aristotle said phronesis is. This is values based in practice, based on judgment and experience, Prudence, common sense, and practical ethics. What do you do in the situation when you're there? The orientation is toward action. You're pragmatic. It's variable in time and space, and it's context dependent. So in this case, compared to the last chart, chart when we're talking about, about um, science, and we're talking about the systems approach to trying to bring in things like the good, the beautiful, this is in the area of phronesis. Skipping slides, because the answer to see is here. Uh, we'll go down to values, okay. So there's multiple ways of describing values, value and values. Here's one that's actually pretty good and it's pretty deep, uh, which value is experienced, right? Have to experience. Now, this, this doesn't mean just economic value but it's part of the aesthetic as well. You can, so I really enjoyed that, people say that. Um, this is work by uh, Irene Ng, who's uh, one of the service science researchers, and what she brings out is that there's, there's ways of looking at the experience when you're talking about value, because there is value before you have the experience, there's value 
during the experience and their value after the experience. More traditional ways of, <clears throat> of looking at this is building on the Greek ideals. Uh, Russ Acoff talks about four ideals. He actually cheats because he, there's actually three ideals that are the Greek, and then he adds on one that's extra. Um, and so the, the Greek ideals are, firstly, truth, the pursuit of truth, which is science, the good, which is ethical and moral principles, and beauty or fun, um, and so this is aesthetics. Now, what he does, he adds on to that, which is plenty, the pursuit of plenty, which has to do with uh, producing and distributing resources or protecting the resources, uh, because he tends to consult towards business organizations and trying to tell them that they have an aesthetic or a moral principle first is a little hard. Though. But, they, but in the, within these four, within these four values, you can actually then define goals and purpose, which is good sometimes, but it's part of the reasons that I don't necessarily work with ACOP all the time. If we look instead to Vickers' concept of appreciative systems, what he looks at is systemic inquiry through a process of perceiving, judging, and acting. And so what he says is that you're going to make three types of judgments when you actually have, uh, you have a world and you try to value what's happening there. You have the rich concept of life, which is a flux of everyday events and um, ideas. From that, you have reality judgments. Reality judgments are what's happening out there, and then value judgments are what's the value of that. And what happens today, where this is actually going to be critical in today's world, where people are arguing about values when they should be arguing about tax. And so this question about, well, what really happened? And this happens a lot in the US political debate when they're saying, well, he said this, and they go, well, actually, he never said that. OK, so is that a value statement, or is that a factual statement? Well, they're actually jumping to the value statement before they've made the factual statement. The idea of relationship maintaining is that you have a you have a um, a longer term relationship socially in the group that kind of overrules the goal seeking. And so when we talk about a system, like people will start describing systems in terms of their goals, but when you talk about an ant, does an ant have a goal? Like you could, they may have a, a you know they have instincts. But do they set goals in the way that we have? Does, have, does, the, does an ant have the ideal of this is beautiful and therefore I should, I should do this? Or this is the right moral thing to do, which we should defend. Now they do by instinct. Uh, when you get down to cells, you get down into biology, do they have goals? And so what happens is that well, quite often we're talking systems, people start ascribing the idea of goals and teleology and the pursuit of truth and these pursuits, which really isn't there. And so are people trying to optimize all the time? Herbert Simon had the idea of satisficing. Well, some people are just satisficing, right? You, that's a little more reasonable, but it's still kind of goal-oriented. The different way of looking at it would be that you are setting this cycle of reality judgments, which is this is what's happening. These are what my values are. And from there, I'm going to make an action judgment, which is this what I'm going to do about it. And you have this cycle organized in the system. Now, here, when we're talking about a system, and, and this is when we start getting into testing you a little bit about it. This is a human system that's around values and facts. And you go, where's the physical part of this? Like, it's, where, can, where can I touch it? Like, it, we'll talk with, so ACOF tends to use these examples of automobiles. And I talk about the TTCs. It's like, well, we can talk about the physicality of an automobile or physicality of the TTC, but if we're talking about the the social side of it, it takes a different view of that. Oh, did, did people get the term satisficing? No. I mean, you threw that out there. Okay. That's, that's a really important concept. That, that sort of... So satisficing is an idea where, as opposed to optimizing on one of the resources or one of the uh, outcomes, is you are satisfying. And so in that case, you would actually set that this is kind of the minimum. And so when you say in your life, so how much exercise do you really have? And you kind of go, oh, I'm really busy. Well, OK, then you need a minimum amount of exercise. What's the minimum amount of exercise you need to function, which is you need to move. If you don't move at all, you're not going to last very long. So. 
Um, here's the drawing, uh, and I'm going to step through a series of drawings. Uh, the appreciation model as an abstract entity, so we have the world, the flux of events and ideas out there. We have an appreciation that happens. From the appreciation, we have action, and the action feeds back into the world. Going to the next level, we, what we do is the judgments are towards maintaining a standard of facts, a standard of values, and rather than a goal seeking. And so, <coughs> when you are trying to change an appreciative system, it's not about optimizing the system. The question is, what is the standard? So when you're talking about facts, how much information do you need before you say, okay, got it, that's a fact? It's not an opinion, it's not hearsay, it's like, okay, so how much is it? And this is, this is actually, when you do it socially, it's a really interesting thing. So, um, so as an example, uh, if we look at, uh, at the coronavirus happening right now, okay, we have the facts. So what is the risk of it? Kind of go, okay, if you look at it scientifically, uh, but it's like, well, socially, what, what does that do to us? What level of paranoia should we have? And it's kind of like, well, there haven't been that many cases. It's less than SARS. It's more than some other flu, state of Mount Peter. You go through all sorts of things. But collectively, we establish a, a standard which says, okay, on the risk level, this is like an orange. It's not a red. You know, it's not a green. It's kind of like in the middle. So that is a level. So you're not trying to optimize and say that, or, you know, we're trying to avoid the flu or trying to be goal direct for it. You just say, there's a level of factualness to it. Now, once you have the fact of the coronavirus, then the question is what of value is, okay, what, how do you value that knowledge and what do you do about it? And it's kind of like, well, if you're older and you actually catch diseases quite easily, then also all of a sudden your value gets a place on top of that, which is, well, I should probably keep myself healthy and stay away from people. If you're young, like most you know, people who are in high school, they don't care, they can live forever, it's like, ah, it's nothing to do. Okay, all right, I'll recover. Then you have the action behind it, and the action would be associated with the fact of value. Yes? What happens if you can't agree on the facts? Because the balance of Exactly the question that check them will take on in software. That's exactly what happens. Yes. Actually, right now, based on the same timeline as SARS, there are far more cases of corona than there were of SARS. So even though the death rate is lower, they expect that the outcome of it is the same amount. It's likely the same amount more people will die of it. There's going to be more cases. That's just happening right now. Well, you So like I feel when we talk about it, yes, this global impact, but like ten thousand people die in the states is significant. And my guess is more people are gonna be dying in the whole area. Okay, working through the system again, you have the flux already in debt, you've got the appreciation, but the appreciation is actually based off a standard. And the standard could change. So it could be that it starts off with just the statistics. They need more information. You need more value judgments on top of that. And this leads to the decision of how to act and maintain or modify the existing relationships, which leads to action. And this cycles, and they go into more detail about how, uh, how the open system works through these cycles. Uh, but the form of the appreciated systems remains the same while it's content setting change. And so the idea is that this is a cycle that happens in human activity through way we process information. Um, it's operationally closed system, but it gets the, the opportunity to, to reproduce itself. And so the facts reproduce themselves, the values reproduce themselves, they're based off history. It's not like you just set a goal and say, okay, that was a fact yesterday, forget everything, and now here's the fact. People go, no, it doesn't work like that. You build on top of it, you set a new standard. The standard could go up or the standard could go down. And then you have the dynamics where you have the appreciative system, you have decision, the action, and it cycles. 
goes back and forth. Okay, this is the foundation of soft system methodology. And soft system methodology, you have to understand a little bit of the history of this, which is um, if you have a sociology background, I'd say, I would say that you probably will learn less. Uh, if you come from an engineering background, this is very popular because it was invented specifically because systems engineering was too blunt an instrument for the complexity of human situations. So systems engineering is all about optimizing systems, right? So you optimize the mechanical system or whatever machine you've got, and you go, oh, I need to expand that to the humans. So I'll optimize the humans and the com computers or whatever machines you've got together. You kind of go, oh, it's a bit tricky to do that. They don't work that way. And so there's a belief which is the world is, contains interacting systems that can be engineered to achieve the objective. Human beings don't respond well to being engineered into a system. So it doesn't necessarily work that way. Um, now he criticizes actually classical operational research, grand corporations, so analysis, the biosystems model, system dynamics. So the causal loops that you're actually creating, he's actually criticizing. None of these approaches pays attention to the existence of conflicting worldviews. There you go. You asked it about conflicting worldviews. This is what it comes down to. You now have a conflict, and that's what's going to happen, is that you won't be able to intervene in a system because some people will say, well, the system is fine. It operates just fine. Other people will say, no, this thing is not working. We need to change it. We need to abandon the idea of the world as a set of systems that we're standing outside of. And here we take the social world being the major issue. We have clashes of worldviews. And so the inquiry is into the world rather than in the world itself. And it's interesting asking about the social parts and where people understand things as opposed to the physical context and things that you can actually grab and are real. So software methodology has steps, and for this, I really need to defer you to this article. It's available online. It's a little long. It's summarized, but these are where I'm getting the diagrams from. And this is like, I think there's 36 diagrams, but it steps through it. But what you do to resolve the uh, conflicting worldviews is you find out about the problematic situation and the characteristics of the intervention. So it's a very focused on a real life problem. It's not something you do in the abstract. And you have to do it with the community that you're involved with. You decide upon some relevant purposeful activities. What you're going to do is try to improve that, and you create activity <coughs> models around that. From the activity models, you use that as sources of questions. And so here, it's the idea is not that you're coming up with answers. The, the key part is coming up with questions, because you end up discussing the questions about how the worldviews are there. Uh, and that surfaces the worldviews. And, and so when someone says, oh, you know, why would you solve the problem that way? It's kind of like, well, this is why we have all these assumptions. Uh, we bring together the results of finding out, which is number one, and the ideas in three. And then you look to find changes which are arguably desirable and culturally feasible. And so this is all about getting people participating in the discussion. Now, for the work that you're doing, and this is a really interesting challenge, is when you're working with a group, in your role of facilitator, are you taking a position, or are you open to whatever the group is going to do? So, so this, 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 this is a lecture, lecture kind of issue. So, I, and, and this is part of the challenges of being a lecturer when I come up, is that I'm actually pretty participative. If you want to go a different direction, we can all go a different direction. Uh, and so there, the, the, the difference is that uh, it's, it's a power relation between the person that's facilitating running this and the people who are participating. If you can get into a situation where everyone's at the same level, the facilitator is as unstable as the people participating, then everyone is equal. Okay, I see a puzzled look on your face. Okay. So it, it could be a case, you, you could be, so, this, so when, I, when, I see, when, I, when I see a true <coughs> or facilitator, my question is, what are they asking for? A true facilitator doesn't have an agenda. It's, they just come and they're just trying to get the people to talk, right? And whatever they decide is fine. And soft system methodology gets you that direction. But there are very few funded projects that will actually really do that. Say, here's how you get to be a decision by the state. It's kind of like, okay, that means that some people in the community are going to disagree, and it's like, even if they disagree, you're going to keep rolling over them because there's time constraints. 
And so you can't really do both, and you end up making trade-offs. Software as a methodology says it's the human system that's important. You can build the technical systems around that. And, and, and then, so we're talking all about facts and judgments, right? So people need to understand what it is that they're making decisions on. They need to understand the differentiation between the facts and the values, because quite often they get mixed up. And then the question is, can you get collective action around that? But that, that um, there's an assumption there that the people that you're facilitating have a certain level of knowledge that they can uh, engage with the participatory process. No. No. If they're in the room, you have to deal with them. And, and that's part of it is, and so my friend David Hawk said, if you, uh, if you don't deal with the irrational, I want to say irrational, now we're talking about the aesthetics and the morality. If you do not deal with the irrational, you end up dealing with the irrational. So someone that comes to a community event and doesn't feel like they're heard, next thing you know, you've got a picket in front of you. And it's kind of like, okay, they're picketing. And it's like, will you come in to discuss? You know, you have to be happy to discuss. But you will let us discuss. Okay, they have, a, they have uh, the four parts of an of a SSM, and there's also a, a seven step, seven principles, so this gets pretty deep. Um, but it's good when you start rolling on. It's a situation calling for action, and what happens is when you actually facilitate this, um, this is where the idea of rich pictures comes from in software and methodology. You get people together, and they jointly create a rich picture of the situation. And that's them drawing, not a facilitator drawing. Okay, and this is one of the reasons that Peter Checklin does everything by hand this way, is that technology now creates a bar, right? And, the, and when you're saying drawing, some people can't draw, it's like, you know, write the words or describe yourself in whatever, whatever way you can do it. But what is the situation we're in and how do you describe that? some tools within the software system methodology. One of them is called Catwolf. So it has customers, uh, the actors, the, um, the, the processes, the owners, and the environment, and kind of covering all that. Make sure you do it. Um, and there's these principles that try to roll around all together. But I really will refer you to the, uh, to the article because it's worth reading. Okay, we're going to turn to service systems. Uh, service systems, you're starting to get the feeling that there's more than one type of system. And some major shifts that have been happening in our world are the shift from agricultural to industrial to service. And they work on different principles. When you talk about an agricultural system, an agricultural system works on the sun, on light and dark, winter and summer. The industrial system works at the pace of the machine which is pretty well, it runs all the time, then you take it down, you put it in maintenance, and then you bring it back up again. Now, if you were making a shift from one to the other, you have a little bit of a challenge. So, so we have a situation where, um, so Peter is a farmer, and I say, oh, Peter, you know, you're, I noticed that you're getting a really bad crop yield. Uh, you're out farming, and it's a really hard life. I have a deal for you. Why don't you come work at my factory? My factory has uh, worked at steady pay, has air conditioning in the summer, heating in the winter, everything was great. And Peter says, fine. Says, okay, then come on Monday at 9 o'clock and we'll start work. And he says, 9 o'clock? Uh, but, you know, it's actually pretty dark. Actually, I was using this with the rain last night. You know, in order for the rain to get here, you get to leave at 6 a.m. So you have to leave in the dark, and it's kind of like, why would you do that? Like in the summer, we work longer hours, and in the winter, we work shorter hours, and we work daylight. No, that's not the way that a factory works. A factory works according to the machine. Machines are either on or off, they run 24 hours, and so we run according to a clock, a machine clock, not a ordinary natural clock of the sun and the seasons. Now when we get to a service economy, and the service system works differently. How does that work? A service system works on demand, 
Nothing happens until you have a customer. The differentiation between an industrial system and a service system is the difference between a bus and a taxi, or a lift, as I got at this party. Uh, the, uh, the bus runs on a route whether there are passengers on it or not. It doesn't care about customers. The door is closed, but you're running up to the door. The door is closed, it's kind of like, okay, too late. It runs running on schedule. A service system runs when the customer wants it to run. Now, the interesting differentiation comes whether you are more concerned about the production systems or the service system, and this simply has to do with supply versus demand. If you are in a, a situation where you have limited supply and lots of demand, a production system prevails because whatever you can build gets sold or consumed. So if people are hungry, they'll eat whatever. They're not going to care about you know, trying to eat your words of production. In a world of abundance, where you have more supply than you have demand, all of a sudden you've got services on top of that. Because the, the customer can actually choose. It's like, no, I don't want to take the PTC. I could take a taxi instead. Or you know, I don't want to eat this. I could eat that. So services will operate differently from industrial systems. And if you look at the economy, this is a very old study, um, and, and the data is actually from 1997, but it's been continuing. You have this world where you have products, uh, sorry, you have material and information, and you have products and services. Now I have to get this right. Up in this corner, material and products, this is kind of General Motors, that's part of the economy, and information and services is, in effect, Facebook, Google, IBM, all the information technology companies. And what's been happening is that this line has been moving this way and up. So the material and product part of the economy is getting smaller and smaller, and the information and the services part of the economy is getting much larger. And so today, 70, 80 percent of most GDP is actually services. It's not product and material. But we just don't think about it that way because traditionally we've always reported GDP that way. Skip some slides. So if we wanted to learn about systems, uh, Jim Spore was asked by uh, Education Bureau in the United States how you would train students for the economy, for the service economy. And we thought about doing it this way. Let's talk about the service systems as they work according to complexity. So we start off with systems that move, store, progress, or process. So transportation system, you take a kindergarten kid, and you have to take them to school anyway, so they learn about the bus, they learn about walking, they learn about cars. Um, second, uh, first grade, teach them about water and waste management, which is a service system. Third one, food and global supply chain. And food and global supply chain as a service, because most of us are not really concerned about production. It's about what happens when the food gets off the farm and gets into the supermarkets, with the law of supply chain that happens there is demand-oriented. Energy and energy grid, things plug into the wall, that's a service system. And information and uh, communications technology, by grade five, by grade four, they've got mobile phones as well. How does that mobile phone actually work? We have the systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building and construction is actually a service industry, it's not a product industry. Banking and finance, retail, hospitality, healthcare, these are all recognized pretty well as service systems. Education, people don't think about it as a service system, and sometimes you might wonder about, about the service you're getting, but it's a service system that has been productionized. So there's education. Before there was mass education, it was a service system where you'd have apprentice, master, apprentice sort of relationships. And now when you get into graduate programs, it should be more of a service relationship than an industrial relationship. We have, finally, the systems that govern cities, regions, uh, states, and nations, and those are the most complex ones, and these are all service systems. Oh, going back to the earlier discussion, like Zappos being part of Amazon, um, that's a mixed service and product. How would you address the question uh, regarding uh, you know, Amazon as a service <coughs> Amazon is one of the largest, cor largest uh, retailers. Now, all retail is actually pretty well serviced, right? They're not producing anything. 
And it's a case now where you have more supply than you have demand. And so placing, getting on the right page, um, product suggestions, these sorts of things are all about trying to get more demand as opposed to getting more supply. A definition of service systems, and it's kind of broken down. A service system is a dynamic configuration of resources. The resources are people, technology, organization, shared information. Service that creates and delivers value. The value is through service. It's between a provider and a customer. And it can be a complex system, and the complex system with interactions and the interface between product, customer, provider, customer, 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 and supplier, supplier. A quick question. Sure. Um, like for service, for example, like the, exa the example of water and waste services. So I see how it's a service. You turn your tap on and there's water. Mm -hmm. But there's latency in the system, there's capacitance. That only works because the pumps are running 24 7. Mm -hmm. The plants are running 24 7. So it's a mechanized mechanical system mm -hmm. that operates all the time. Mm -hmm. And that, in turn, unless you're talking about nuclear energy, is based on sun energy, whether it's latently stored in coal. Mm -hmm or you're using renewables or whatever. Like, how do you define your industry as being service? Like, is that just the part that most people see? Because there's this whole other part that runs on the other systems all the time. Amazon doesn't work if they don't have stock. Yeah. So that depends on everything else. So yeah, where do yeah. you draw the line? So you're back to the first question, which is the which question. Which system are you talking about? Because there's multiple systems that play here that are interlocking with each other. So, uh, so it, it's scope, really. All these systems exist all the time. But you say this is the system of interest, and then the other ones are the systems that participate with that. So you're just assuming enough capacitance in the system, basically. Uh, it's system of interest, and so it's it's where you're focusing. So, and this is why I focus on system changes, because if you if you focus on a system that you're going to change, are you going to change the production system, or are you going to change the service system? If you to, to that question. Identify your system of interest as the service system. Mm -hmm. You will have to assume that something is coming into that system from the others. Yes. So you provide system, uh, yes. Service. Yes. But, it, but if you look at it from a problem standpoint, the problem in the service system or the production system. So, so either it's going to be one or the other generally, you're going to focus more on one. So you, you are really back to the which question. You say, I understand there's, that there's production there, but we're focused on the service system right now, and that means we're focused on the customer rather than the factory. So then just to add on to that, yes. I'm So the, the question I would ask in, in the case of not having enough water, that means that what you're saying is that demand exceeds supply. Is that true or is that not true? So when you say, when you say they've run out of water, is that because there's actually no water in the reservoir, or is that because the service system is overcharged and people can't afford to buy it? No water in the reservoir. No water in the reservoir. So that's a production system issue, so it's not a service system. Well, you can have yes. more water, though. Hmm? No, no, but, but yes, I mean, it's the natural, it's about production system on the water, but then, but then it, 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 it cripples the service system. Yeah. So then so, what do you call it? Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm but what, 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 what I'm saying is try to improve the customer service when your production is down. So this is why I'm saying demand and supply, right? So so in issue, in, in situations where you have more demand than you have supply, you're interested in the production issue. You're interested in the production because you need to get more water. Now, if, they, if you can't do that, then it's a breakdown in the production system. Is there, the question, there, there could be a breakdown in the service system, but until you fix the breakdown in the production system, you're not going to get any service. So, right, but backing up to your initial question, was there, is there enough supply? I think the actual answer is yes. using the water more, um, being more 
or where? But, well, that, that actually backs into the way that construction permits have been granted, and so they've got more people coming into the city because of that. That's one of the issues. And so you're increasing the density into, into a city where, so, you, so the, the malfunctioning service system is actually the construction system. Is that they permitted they permitted people to build buildings that caused that increased demand for water. So the, the issue in the world, so this is kind of the argument that there's lots of food in the world, it's just distributed unequally. Right? So if, if it's not, if you, if, you, if you believe that, that there's lots of food in the world, and you're saying there's not a production issue in the world, it's all a service issue. It's about how you distribute food. Yes. So if the service system is the system of the production is the cost of the new power of the additional water. Yes. Then if I'm focusing on the system, the service system, then I'm looking at what could be done within that system to manage the, that there's no production, right? No, so it so it's just so the, the, the question is, is, do you look at a system from the push or the pull? And so the push is production, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the question is, will pulling, changing the way you pull on that actually make a difference? Well, so could you actually change the consumption? You, you might be able to change the consumption, but as a service system, it's kind of like, well, one, one of the ways of reducing consumption would be move people out of the city. Move them further from water. That would, so that would be the service system. That would be a service system. Yeah. So that's Re -re -re Reduce the service load. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think either either I function in the space of trying to manage that there is no water, or I go to the system of production where I try to see where it can be sourced. Yeah. Right. So, so, so an exa example of getting a service system would be that, um, uh, so factories will not get water. We're just going to shut down the factories, and then we'll have enough water because, um, right, that, that's a service system response. Because, because you're still producing the same amount of water, right? But from service response, you say, we're not going to serve these customers. I'm going to fire these customers. You can't afford them. That's a service system response. More of a starting tree trying to find the back. Well, it, it, again, system of interest. And, and that's why you end up with this question of trying to, and now we're going go back a little bit and discuss worldviews. So if your worldview is that you're focused, if you're a marketing person, then you kind of go, you know, we're just going to fix it through better marketing and influencing people. It's kind of like, well, that's just a production issue. And the fact that you don't have water, it doesn't matter how much you sell or change people's behavior, there's no water, it's still a production issue, right? Okay. Okay. Water, then it's a if you have, if, if, so you demand, have water, but it's, it's a limited amount. Yeah. Then it goes back to changing the service system in terms of like the usage. Well, again, are you down? Is, is that a case where supply exceeds demand or demand exceeds supply? So you can use it in the same way. Is it the interaction of both of the lives or is it the system of central application? Are you like, if you define your, yourself on the service side, you're looking for a solution there? Mm -hmm. You're externalizing the production side. So you look at it all together, then you're going to look. You're going to solve the problem differently. So the solution might be, well, have everybody use less water. If you're just looking at service, ration it. Right. If you're looking at the production side, you might say, okay, let's bring in diesel and you know dry ocean water and treat that properly with mineral filtration or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you look at them holistically, then you can do a combination of things. If you've already drawn your boundary, it's going to determine what kind of solution you come up with until you draw a blank. And then you expand, but by then you both spent a lot of time and effort. Again, defining system of interest gets to be that challenge, right? Yeah. And so, so then also, if you take the soft systems approach, and it's not just about the water, now it's about the people. Mm -hmm. So, who's setting the policy? Are they in the room with people that actually don't have water? The, uh, the people that don't have water actually get to participate in a conversation about what they do with it. Because if they say, shut down the factories, because we don't have any water, we can't put down water to drink. If they don't have that forum, then you've now got the behavior rational. You've got the behavior rational, behavior rational. I have a concrete example. So when I worked as a consultant in Kitchener Waterloo, we had a project for the region of Waterloo around 
uh, the use of road salt uh, in the region because what was happening was, uh, well, Kitchener-Waterloo has a much more snowier climate than even Toronto, uh, but what was happening was the, there was so much salt in the water that someone released a blue crab, I believe it was, into one of the waterways and it lived. And so then that was, that was supposed to be an ocean dwelling creature. And so that reality for the region was terrifying and obviously for us was also terrifying. And they said, how, how will we reduce the use of road salt? And so we had to look at, well, who are the people who are using road salt and why are they using road salt? And is this just, cause the region was like, we're gonna, we're gonna invest in sending out small cups to people to use for, for spreading their salt. And if they use a smaller cup, and it has the region's logo on it, this is gonna solve the problem. And we were like, well, maybe not so much. Uh, and what we learned was there were so many different uh, inputs from a service pers perspective around insurance and who's liable for injuries on those spaces and the, the actual, like, uh, when they build a LEED certified building, what does that actually mean? And what is the, the snow removal that needs to be required? There's a million different systems that are involved in, in that from a service perspective. And the system of interest was, I, I guess, the region, but we kind of had more of an ecological perspective. Post intervention. Ah, uh, multiple interventions. So unfortunately, here's, a, here's another great and terrible example of what happens when you work in systems. Often they go, well, we just need to tell people, so let's do a communications thing and make a bunch of banners that say, don't use salt. And, and <laughs> we were like, well, wait a minute, how about you change some of your planning requirements for when somebody builds a new building that there's requirements around the size of the parking lot and who's actually salting it. Let's work with the, the, the landscaping companies who are actually the people who are clearing parking lots because they have issues around uh, maintaining employer, people who are employed who do this work and they want things to be done fast. And so there was, yeah, they ended up putting up banners and uh, we, we at the point, got them to the point of talking about policy change, but it was not. They're saying they can go eat some really good crab and water the Maybe I don't. There was only one, so unfortunately, it didn't spawn any Waterloo blue crab. Um, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Okay, when we talk about um, services, there's often confusion. When people uh, used to be not so much today, but people would think that this means McJobs, the service economy. We think 85 percent of the economy is McJobs, but the second side you create a crap, create a class uh, from Richard, Florida. So everyone in this room is creative sector. Like, there's just no doubt about it. You're here because you're creating things. Uh, but it is a disproportionate uh, amount of percentage of wealth generated. The creative class creates more, uh, more wealth, and so that's why people are interested in it. Uh, let's skip some slides. OK, so service systems are different because they are value co-creation configurations of resources. And what's it mean with that? That means that the customer participates with the provider. It's not just a provider dropping off something at your doorstep and then saying bye. So the old idea of a product, let's say, take automobiles as an example, automobile where it's like you bought the car, you own the car, you maintain the car. So we transfer all responsibility away when it's a product and it's able to do that. When it's a service, it's a co-production and the example that we talk about with co-production in the systems literature has traditionally been the uh, acorn and the oak tree. So what does co-production mean? Well, okay, how do you grow a tree? I give you an acorn. Okay, acorn and water, acorn and water and soil. Can you guarantee me that a tree grows? And the answer is no. Okay, what else do you need? Well, you may need drainage, you may need more sunshine, all these sorts of things. But the idea is one of co-production. All these things together co-produce. It's not like you can actually build a tree and then ship it. Basic concepts. 
Okay, there are 10 basic concepts that I'll skip over. Um, and we'll go to offerings. Um, and this is the work of Raphael Ramirez from Oxford now. Um, but the way that he would uh, uh, approach looking at the world would be uh, through the theory, theory of what was called offering. And this actually came from originally from uh, Richard Norman, who was starting with theory of the firm. Theory of the firm is why do companies exist. But it, why do companies exist is really big, and so he said, let's go down to another level, which is why does offering exist? An offering, as he defined it, has three dimensions. Physical content, service content, and people content. So as an example, General Motors has a physical car, they've got uh, OnStar, uh, and they've got uh, people content, people that will actually service the car. And you can cre you create these in three different configurations, different sizes, and so Toyota has an example where they try to do more people content and less emphasis, less emphasis on the hardware and the software part of it. You can do this to a uh, bicycle example. An offering can be an input, it can be uh, an output, an input, or a co-creation. So here's an example of a pedicab. This is an offering output production. You just walk up and what the pedicab bike provider gives you is everything. You just step into it. You don't participate in it. You're not bicycling. You're not maintaining it. And that is output. His offering is the pedicab. If you have an offering input co-production, now it's like, okay, so you build your own bike, you customize your own bike, you maintain your own bike. And what they do is they provide you all the parts and you're doing all the work. And so that offering is input. But you can also have a value elevating co-creation where customers and um, providers participate together. And a bike share is that, uh, particularly ones that are cooperative. But what happens is that you have to provide the service stuff. It's not like getting into a taxi. You have to still pedal. They provide the maintenance, but it's a co-creation. If we look at these in, in the way that we create value, there's customer value to the transaction, and customer value to the relationship. So the way we normally have thought about, about the world was as, sorry, that's my power, uh, was as uh, offering an output. And industrial logic is we build the car and you get the car, that's it, okay? An offering as input is much more like an ATM machine. So we, as opposed to giving you a, um, a service, or the, uh, as opposed to offering you the product that's something that's already done, you have to participate in it. So as ATM, you have to punch in the number. You go, couldn't I go to a teller and just get that offering as output? Yes, you can do that. And so we've actually been pushed into an idea of offering of input that took a while to get over that hump. If you're looking for customer value through relationship, you can move from the industrial logic to a service logic, which is we're not going to sell you the car and make you own it, we're going to let you lease it. And it's based on customer satisfaction and you own it for a while. And then you have partnership logic where we have all the inputs um, and you cooperate together. So an example of this has been uh, differentiation. So when I was at IBM, we had IBM Research and we had IBM Consulting. And I was at IBM Consulting, but I had high quality research people. So what happens if you go to IBM Research and you say, and I actually say, you can get some people from IBM Research for free, like we don't charge for IBM Research. But number one, for every person, every PhD I bring on site, I want a master's employee on the other side matching the time. And secondly, we have no guarantee about the outcome. This is research. So we're gonna develop something with you. It may become a product. It may not become a product. Are you interested? And the customer usually says at that point, no, I want, you know, I'm going to give you money, IBM. We want something from you. Oh, that's not this type of relationship. It's not a partnership logic. You want a deliverable. You want an output. You don't want the input, which is a researcher. You actually want an output. I'm not consultant. I can do that for you. I will guarantee you an output. So when you're looking at the offering, the question about whether you're providing the output or providing the inputs actually changes the relationship. If you're providing inputs, is a co-production relationship. If it is just giving you the product and leaving, that's a producer-product relationship, which is a little different. Uh, more theory of the class with that for time. There's books available on certified. And we'll talk about socio-technical systems perspective. 
Before, we had talked about three perspectives, and I'm going to remind you. The socio-psychological system perspective came out of the Second World War. You've got uh, soldiers who are coming back into peacetime. And so the question is, how do you get the society and the, uh, the soldier, returning soldiers to work together? Because it's not just a psychological problem. We have the socio-ecological perspective we took last week, which was things outside the system and how they're changing. And this week, we're focused on the socio-technical system perspective. And this is the best match between a social and a technical system. And then these principles of joint optimization and the second design principle that I'm going to talk about right now. So they, they, they stress that a socio-technical system is not, it's a perspective, it's not a theory. And so there's a, a whole volume on it. But what they're talking about, and we'll go back to the original, uh, the original research, which is done in the coal mines. When they introduced, uh, so originally coal mines were done all manually, and they go with pickaxes and shovels and things like that. And then they introduced what's called a long wall machine. The long wall machine is a machine that goes up, and a person actually, you get the team, and the team now turns the crank and moves the thing forward, and coal falls. But what was happening was that people were dying because, in effect, they were part of the machine. So you have machines and people working together. How do you get that working together? Uh, and, then, and this is a case where the relationship between the social, the psychological, and the engineering are all together. And so you have to look at the technological system as a whole and the environment of the underground mining situation. So this, again, is defining the problem. When you, the question is, can you actually just say this is a social problem or it's a psychological problem? And you say, no, you can't do that. It has to do with technology. But you can't say, just change the technology because they just introduced te new technology. Go ahead and say, it's a, it's a technology problem. We're going to do away with it and say, OK, we're going to go back and pick an axe and shovels, which is not really going to happen. Right? So you have to figure out how to optimize the machines and the people together. There are different design principles that are associated with this. Um, and the first one is called, um, D, they, they call it DP1, Design Principle 1. And this is on redundancy of parts. OK, now we have to go back. And then, now this is where we have to go back to the definition of the system again. So we have to be reminded of structure, the arrangement of parts, process. Sorry, stru structure is arrangement in space. Process is arrangement in time, and function is contribution of the part to the whole. So if we're going to have redundancy of parts, this is structure. And the way that's designed is you have people, and the people are each given tasks, and you divide it up. In this case, you have a supervisor that is actually responsible for the command and control, but the people are interchangeable. Now, Go to McDonald's, favorite example. Everyone at McDonald's is trained for a job. You don't get to negotiate what you do. You come into the job, this is the job, everyone does the job this way. Now, it could be a multiple roles, so as opposed to being in the cash, you might be um, on the grill, but you are trained in that role, and if something happens, you get replaced. That is redundancy in the parts. The function remains the same because everyone functions the same. Everyone has the same function. They don't care if you have a PhD in flipping burgers because that's what the specification is. You are the same as everybody else. The alternative is design principle two, which is redundancy of function. Now, how do you get redundancy of function as opposed to redundancy in the structure? And that's by putting responsibility for coordination and control inside the system. So in this case, what it means is you are not optimizing at the level of the individual, uh, sorry, not optimizing at the, at the individual level, so individual parts, you're optimizing for the group. If you're optimizing in the group, that means you are sub-optimizing for the individual. The way that you place people, if you're doing it this way, is that people each have natural abilities, natural preferences, and they self-organize autonomously. But they're accountable to the team. So in the case of the, uh, um, so we were talking about holacracy before, okay? Um, so if, if, you have a, if you have a group of people, let's take a, um, let's, how about an example, a software development example? Software development example, uh, often today in today's hiring, 
So they say, we need a Java program. Every Java programmer is the same. That would be redundancy of parts, which is, you know, this guy doesn't work out, going to fire him because he's the problem. Right? He has a specification. And you go, but this is the guy that invented Java. I don't care. I can't write Java the way I want to write it. I just want this done. That's for, I'll swap it out and swap someone else in. On the other one, on the other example, if you had a team, and you have the guy that invented Java on your team, how are you going to use that team? You're not going to use that one individual like everybody else. You're going to shape the team around that person. So the, the question comes, do you shape the job to the person, or do you shape the person to the job? Um, Russ Acoff did, a, a, did a, uh, an example. This is actually the design of acquired system. So uh, typically, the second way of knowing is an analytically deductive way of hiring people. So when you hire people, traditionally they have a scorecard. And so you want to be CEO. And you say, well, the CEO should be this much in people leadership and this much in technical skill and this much in these other categories. And you create a scorecard. You go across all the candidates. You go, OK, we'll fill in the blank. And, and this, every CEO is the same. Uh, the problem with doing that is that you're working from the abstract to the concrete. You could go the other direction, which is, okay, if we have the CEO and we hired them, what would the company be? So if you want a company that needs to be uh, more progressive, do you hire a woman? And you go, no, every CEO is the same. Doesn't matter man or woman, doesn't matter, it's the same. And I go, well, I don't know. If you hired someone uh, visible in the minority, does it change? It may not change, it may change. But these sorts of factors, working from someone concrete and saying that it is about the team organization, how that person fits into the team, as opposed to saying it's about the individual, the part that can be swapped in and out, makes a difference in how you approach. Does that help? Yes. Okay. So if, if there's a if, the, the problem I've seen in the whole autocracy literature is that people have not read a large body of work that's in social technical systems theory. Uh, this, this is just touching the surface of all sorts of things that, that, uh, that uh, happen in this world. Uh, one of the interesting byproducts that people don't really appreciate is you go through Tavistock. So Tavistock was developed in the UK, and Eric Trist is the person that you should follow. Eric Trist started uh, in the you started in England. Uh, ended up at UCLA, didn't work out, ended up at the University of Pennsylvania with Russ Acoff for a long time, and then finished his career at York University. York University, the Faculty of Environmental Studies, is the Faculty of System Studies that Eric Trist was there. The last time you read an article about the quality of work life, it was published on Ontario by the Ministry of Labor in 1980 by Eric Trist. The ideas of job rotation, the ideas of task autonomy, things that you learn inside of organization design work. That's that stuff that came out of all that research and in some a lot of respects you forgot. And I'd say we're probably suggesting that it be reduced. I mean, so that's uh, kind of almost going without saying this is good this is you know this is solid work. And that wasn't for one reason or another, it wasn't picked up on um, into the 90s or 2000s. One of my friends accuses uh, Bill Gates for causing this problem because when we start thinking about people like computers and like machines, all the machines are the same. Uh, it's not a good way of working. Uh, but he was one of the first people to also hire programmers at extraordinary rates of pay because he recognized, he recognized that. Uh, there were extraordinary programmers that were magnitudes better than having teams programmed. <laughs> so you did actually design teams around people you know, to some extent. And was a programmer himself. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to extend this, um, there is more current research. So Rafa Ramirez, 2013, the article. And this is moving away from, uh, so DP1 and DP2 were in the period where uh, we're, we're dealing before internet and before network form organizations. So in effect, the question is, could we update that? And he has this idea of, uh, of uh, redundancy of potentialities 
which would be that you can't just take your business or your organization and look at socio-technically this way. You have to look at the cross-organizational boundaries, and you have to look at it outside. So if you're in a, a contractor relationship and you've got multiple contractors contributing towards the whole, there's two ways you can do it. You can say, every contractor is the same, and it's going to have the spec and do that job. Or you're going to end up in a situation where you say, well, no, if we hire this one contractor, they're going to do a job this way, and they're not exactly swapping, but we'll bring them in as part of the team. So the question would be, do you consider people outside of your immediate organization as part of your team, which you allow you for the redundancy of function, or do you treat them as interchangeable parts? And that's what the, uh, the updated research is about. And I'm going to close. Uh, and we'll have some discussion. We've covered a lot. Yes? Sorry, I just wanted to go back to your earlier comment about the report that I've done at the university that was really talking about the university and the university that was really talking about. It reminds me of just what we heard last week, which mentioned that the candidates are the home site. So why would you think if this work had been Well, it actually happened. It happened that people take it for granted. It's like, so I was an employee of IBM Canada, which is a corporation that is um, based in Ontario. So we want to follow under Ontario labor laws. Um, and I'll tell you that when I left IBM, I was happy to be under Ontario labor laws, not under American labor laws. So you're talking about the outfits that were interested in. I was more wondering about the process of that, the application. The, so uh, the, 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 the current thinking, so since I went to business school, I graduated business school in 1982, so I'm one of the people that actually used to read these articles originally. The prevailing way of managing comes out of Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley thinks that people are like kings. And so that's, that's really the prevailing way of working. Now, there are a lot of situations and places where people don't, where the manager don't believe people are machines in which case they're, they're in the other camp. They're much more socio-technical. And they believe in groups working together. Um, it's, it's a long-term proposition, it's not short term. It would, it, the real difference is whether you treat people as interchangeable or not. And there are different designs, and, and there's reasons for doing them. So a lot of the people would say that um, we should be doing DP1 designs. And it's like, it's actually fine. The McDonald's works fine if you understand that's the system that works in because they are dependent on interchangeable people. But there better be more supply of people than there are uh, uh, of demand, right? So if McDonald's runs into problems and can't hire people, they have problems tracking people, all of a sudden the team becomes much more important. I would also say from a, from a practice standpoint, it's often challenging to bring people along into systems just as much as like learning about all this has been kind of you know, challenging for students. It's challenging for for clients as well, and and uh, for for everyone, there are obstacles to kind of understanding because it is often quite counter to how we are taught and how we believe in the world. And so, uh, to explain to someone that there are kind of, you know, things are not things are artificial. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, it, it can break your brain a little bit. So, uh, yeah, it's. But I think once you get it, it, it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to how you work. I'm just thinking more like along the lines of design thinking or design practices has become mainstream. Yeah. Um, and what that gives is just the idea of thinking of reiteration that things are never complete. Yeah. And the idea of thinking about the end user experience, not just what you want to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, sh it shows up in different ways in different organizations at different levels of, of understanding, just in the same way that, and I would say also like design thinking 
is not as commonplace as we believe it to be. Like we're in a bubble here at OCAD, believing that everyone understands what design thinking is. I've, I have facilitated and said, has anyone heard of an empathy map and had zero hands go up in a room of 200 people? So things are not as kind of dispersed as we believe. I would say, obviously, as a systems practitioner and somebody who consults, I hope that it gets more commonplace and more out in the world, but I don't know. I'd add to that. We're, we're looking to create something of a fusion between systems thinking and design, design thinking. And design thinking can be considered, if you really look at it, especially from a systems perspective, it is a, I don't want to say optimization, but it's a progression in that iteration toward values. It tries to accommodate a user, user-centered or human-centered approach, which is considering the values uh, within the system. But what it's a very, what's very difficult to do, especially once you take a hard, let's say get fixed toward using the values of, the, of not the people in the system, but the users, let's say the consumers or the people who the system is intended for at the end use, that if we're only concerned about empathy and val- their values, you tend to sub-optimize the whole system. That is, we can over think of it with patient centricity in the hospital. If you try to optimize every patient's personal outcome according to their values, you're not going to have the slack, the efficiency, the you're not even going to be able to, to account for the, the flow of patients through the beds and maintaining you know, the economic <coughs> model of the hospital itself. So systems thinking can be criticized for being too optimized against certain principles which are independent. I wouldn't say independent of values because that's where you get appreciative systems, but we're still looking for regularities, principles that that are regular across certain types, like like the DP, like the models Davis just showing. You can see what hasn't really been done very well is an integration of those, where we can take the best of both. But so I'd say if we design thinking with its iterations towards sort of what's believed to be a preferred outcome can can uh, create a very suboptimal system that's actually ends up being very non-efficient and therefore counter to the real intents. Like in the hospital, people actually don't want to spend time having a being treated well. They want to be treated well and have the least amount of time <laughs> possible for the recovery. I would say, though, too, though, Peter, that that's the work of service design. Like, the the work of service design Mm -hmm. is to to take a more systemic approach. I don't know that that's necessarily happening. They aren't that good at it. Yeah, (laughs) I think a a lot of... It's not that way. No, a lot of service design doesn't come out as from that kind of level. And so if you are truly doing the work of service design, you're not considering only the people at the end of the system you're considering all of the value that's created for all of the essentially humans, kind of, well, systems, I guess, that are in that in that system. So you need to be able to balance. It's like the difference between a volume knob and an equalizer, right? Like, I, like it, one is on or off. It's like, is this good or bad? But service design is more like, like fiddling around to figure out where do I give the most to this thing and least to this. Um, but yeah, it's not taught that way necessarily. So you know, no, it's a good plug for what we're trying to do. Yeah. No, it's service design is more likely what you'll be doing after graduating from a program like this. Yeah. Because there's no, there are very few, there are jobs for systemic design, actually. They've been mostly in government and innovation labs. Uh, when Alex Ryan was in Alberta, and developed a whole competency in, in systemic design. The government of Alberta across, you know, uh, Many of the, 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 you know, across the, the ministries and departments, and is doing something similar at Mars. Um, and there's probably more recognition of it in Europe. Um, however, I think we could start to transform service design by practicing with this fusion of approaches that, you know, we're, because there is a liter- most of the literature in systemic design and from the RSD conferences deals with service applications, but a lot of those applications aren't really cognizant of the literature on service systems. Mm-hmm. They tend to cite service dominant logic and, and Vargo and Lush and, and maybe, you know, and, and, but really don't take into account the work that's been done in service systems. It's amazing how, how many gaps there are in that. 
And it's also it's challenging you. if you, you have do. someone who does know about design thinking to bring in this kind of thinking because they think, oh, all I'm doing is making something great for that person at the end. And if your client doesn't realize that this is a reflexive process, like they are actually going to have to change and do something to actually like, you know, bring it along from a more systemic perspective, such as incorporate stakeholders in decision-making processes that are not just about, you know, the color of the chair, uh, but about how the system, you know, delivers the service. That's, that is where it gets a little more complex. Yeah, and complicated. It becomes a political yeah. process. Yeah. That whenever you try to expand the number of stakeholders um, into, into client-sponsor situations, because they own those relationships yeah. for the most part, or your ability to expand them, and you come in as a consulting designer or within an organization, those values are already pretty well set. Oh, usually. yeah. It's, it takes a lot of, it takes more than methodology to change yeah. that. It's very, like, colonial, patriarchal <laughs> kind of thinking, like... We know what's best for people instead of it be like, oh, wait a second, they actually, you know, I'm speaking specifically also because I did a whole bunch of work with children. So, like, how do you bring children in to a decision-making process mm -hmm. with people who consider themselves to be experts at childhood and have them be considered as equals? Or even, I, I would always call them experts at childhood because they are. They're living in childhood. They know what childhood is like. Like patients. Yeah. Yeah. Should we give him a break? Yeah. It's like a break. What are we doing after the break?